real quick before I get started, I want to talk to you real fast about misunderstanding text. <laughs> We're going to talk a little about that today. Context, what the Bible is trying to tell us. Don't jump to conclusions too quick. Uh, we're going to talk a little in context in the story today. And to, to dress this story up real fast, I had something interesting happen uh, this week talking about words not getting across correctly. Uh, y'all may know um, Rick Godsey. He, he's the guy, he, he comes in here, his wife's Deanna. They have a son. Uh, Rick had to go to the hospital because of a heart issue, and he was in there for several days, and they weren't sure what was going on. I heard they were having to put him on that glycerin, nitro, whatever stuff to, that helps for heart stuff, and I was keeping up with him, asking how it's going, how things are doing, and they had to put a chip in him or something that's like, I guess it gets on Wi-Fi or something. It's like all Star Trek now. And they could uh, keep track of his heart and all this stuff. Well, I was real curious what was going on, and I texted, and his wife, Deanna, answered on his phone. And I said, how's Rick doing? And she wrote back, passed away. And I did the same thing you just did. I said, what? And I said, what? I, I started to call, and she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I meant to say Pastor Ray. <laughs> and it hit me as passed away. So don't call me passed away. Call me Pastor Ray. That went across wrong, and I got real scared real quick. So I know that's a joke that's going to stick around, so I figured I'd go ahead and give it to you on a silver platter, and I know you're going to play with it for a while, but it's about context. I, I didn't understand. She was obviously using the speech recognition thing in her phone, and it said passed away. What at the wrong time to give that when I'm asking, how's Rick doing? Passed away. So um, I asked his permission if I could use this. He said, have fun with it, man. So he's not here today. He, we're going to pray for him to get better, of course. But uh, call me Pastor Ray, okay? I don't need no more of that. that. I about had a heart attack hearing that. Okay, bad text. And uh, another thing about <laughs> bad texting, another one. I, I have these happen often. Uh, Anna was in the grocery store uh, getting supper, uh, and I was over across the street at PetSmart. Well, what do you want me to get and all this stuff? Well, Joanna texted, what's today's message titled? And I answered, I thought I was answering just Anna, but I was answering my text that I have with Anna and Joanna. And so she said, what's today's uh, message called? And I wrote back, cheese Doritos. So you almost got a bulletin that said, Joshua 15, cheese Doritos, <laughs> by passed away. Okay, full of this. Context, guys, context. <laughs> We're going to go through context. Now, if I can get myself together, because if you thought that was funny, what do you see what I'm about to read? Uh, Joshua 15 and 20. Uh, we're going to be talking about the cities of Judah. And I tried to listen to narration of these cities to try to get the cor correct pr pr pronunciation. And I gave up. Okay, I gave up. So I'm just going to do what I can do. And y'all hang with me. Okay. <clears throat> oh, oh, here it is. I'm finally here. God, help me. <laughs> Verse 20. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. The cities at the limits of the tribe of the children of Judah toward the border of Edom in the south were Kabzeel, Eder, Jagur, Kenna, Demona, Adab, 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 Adada. I'm getting this mixed up. You're talking, you're looking at a guy that has about 10% dyslexia, okay? So, ooh, here we go. Adada, Kadesh, Hazor, Ethnan, Ziph, Telem, Bealoth, Hazor, Hadata, Kerioth, Hezron, which is Hazor, Amem, Shema, Molada, Hazar Gada, Heshmon, Beth Pelet, Haz, Hazar Shual, Beersheba, Bizjoth, ha? Bizjoth, ha? Okay, we'll just let that one be. Bela, Ijem, Ezum, El Tolad, Chezel, Horma, Ziklag, I've heard of Ziklag before, Madman, Madmana, Sansana, here y'all laughing, Lebeoth, Shelhim, they're thinking, man, he's got a long way to go, Ain and Remon, all the cities are 29 with their villages. Okay, I need to sit down. Okay, no, I'll keep going. All right. Mm, verse 33, in the lowland, 
Eshtael, Zorah, Ashna, Zanoah, and Ganem, Tapoa, Enam, Jarmuth. I should just hire a Hebrew-speaking guy to do this. Adullam, Sako, Ezekah, Shereim, Adithaim, Gadera, and Gehuio, Gederiothium. Fourteen cities with their villages. Verse 37, Zenan, Hadasha, Migdal, Gad, Delian, Mizpah, Jokthiel, Lachish, Bosgath, Eglon, Kabon, Lamas, Kithlish, Gadiroth, Beth Dagon, Nema, and Makeda. Anybody want to come take over? Sixteen cities with their villages. Verse 42, Libna, Ether, Eshan, Jephtha, Ashna, Nezib, hope that's right, Kela, Akzib, and Maresha. Nine cities with their villages. Verse 45, Ekron with its towns and villages, from Ekron to the sea, all that lay near Ashdod with their villages. Ashdod with its towns and villages, Gaza with its towns and villages, as far as the brook of Egypt and the great sea with its coastline. And in the mountain country, Shamir, Jatir, Socho, Dana, Kerjath, Sana, which is Debir, Anab, I'm getting tired, y'all. I'm uh, marathon. <laughs> go, Ray, go, Ray. Eshtimo, Anim, Goshen, Holon, and Gilo, 11 cities with their villages. Verse 52, Arab, Doma, Eshian, Janum, Beth Tapua, Afik, Afika, Humta, Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron, and Zior, nine cities with their villages. Maon, Carmel, I've been there actually, so I know that one at least. Carmel, Ziph, Juta, Jezreel, Jogdiam, Zenoa, Cain, Gibeah, and Timnah, ten cities with their villages. Halhul, Beth Zur, Gedor, Mereth, Beth Enoth, and Eltikon, six cities with their villages. Kirjath Bel, which is Kirjath Jerim, and Rabbah, two cities with their villages. Nibshan, the city of salt, and Engedi, been there too. Six cities with their villages. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah, could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Thank you all so much for coming today. It was wonderful being with you. Go with God. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I want to rest. <laughs> okay. You know that little app that you can just press play and it like reads it to you? I'm just going to push play and hold it to the mic let it do its thing. Oh, that was rough. Okay, anyway, all these towns here, they're listed according to their geographic locations. This is Judah's territory, territory that they're picking up. Now, a bunch of towns are listed together in the south, and some listed in the west, and some in the central hill, hill country, and some out in the wilderness sloping down towards the Dead Sea. Now, this is a big list of cities here that we just read. <laughs> Trust me, I know it was a big list. And I'm sure you did too, having to go through the tours or listening to me trying to pronounce them all. Huge list, but an important city that you don't see in that list that you did not hear is Bethlehem. Now, when I read that, I go, wait a minute, where's, where's Bethlehem? I'm looking for the cities I can say. I can say Bethlehem. You can say Bethlehem. We sing it. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Where's Bethlehem? It's not in there. And Bethlehem is so important in prophecy. So why is it not there? Okay, here comes my, my little issue, my little problem in the text. What, what's going on here? Bethlehem, very important. First of all, Beth means house. You know, we, we're, also, we're Calvary Chapel Pearland, but we're also known as Calvary Chapel Beth Shalom. Beth means house. Shalom means peace. So this would be house of peace. Beth Shalom. Okay. Well, Lehem, and I hope I said that right. I tried to get guttural like I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to go Lehem like a Texan. Lehem means bread. So what does Beth Lehem mean? It means house of bread. House of bread. Now, when I first read this, I thought up front, maybe, perhaps, Bethlehem had not yet been founded. 
Maybe it wasn't in existence yet. Um, at, you know, at this point in history when Joshua and Israel entered the land. But when I read on ahead and got past through to Joshua chapter 19, Bethlehem is listed. It's in there. So it's already here. Bethlehem, Bethlehem is mentioned as being within Judah's territory. And so we know it is already there. In fact, Bethlehem is mentioned as far back because I wanted to find out when do we first hear about Bethlehem? It's all the way back in Genesis. <laughs> this place has been around a long time. Genesis 35, 19 says, So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Okay, so Bethlehem's been around a long time. In the Genesis account, Ephrath is what would become known as Bethlehem, but whatever it was called, it did exist already long before Joshua and the Israelites came in and took over the land, before they took over that territory. Ephrath, back then, is what is known as Bethlehem today. Now, Ephrath is not only the name of this old Genesis location where Rachel died, but the name Ephrath also means fruitful. Fruitful. And we can see both of these two names, they're both synonymous names, Bethlehem and Ephrath, are both brought together in the prophecy of Micah. And that's in Micah 5 2. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old from everlasting. These are the nice little things you find when you really dig in the Bible. These little things that just pop out like this. Ephrath is way over here in Genesis. Bethlehem is way over here. And they're merged together in Micah in prophecy. Dove stressed prophecy in his video just now. we got to remember, prophecy is very important because it tells you what's ahead, what's, what's coming. And also, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You ever talk to these Christians, what do you know about prophecy? Oh, I don't care about prophecy. Oh, you don't care about Jesus. That's part of Jesus right there is prophecy. So here it is right here. Now the prophecy says that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, house of bread, a fruitful house of bread, which makes sense since Jesus said, I am the bread of life. No wonder he would come from fruitful house of bread. Nice, isn't it? And so Bethlehem is indeed in Judah. This is the territory that's being discussed here in Joshua 15, Judah's inheritance. So notice now, now that we're in this prophecy here, notice that Micah refers to Bethlehem as being little. Little. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. It's for, it, it is said as being little. It says, though you are little among the thousands of Judah. In fact, Bethlehem is not mentioned until Joshua chapter 19, because I was looking for it. Because in chapter 19, we're going to see that Simeon, he gets an inheritance within the inheritance of Judah. And if you look at uh, Joshua 19, verse 9, it says the share of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon, they had their inheritance within the inheritance of that people. So Simeon gets an inheritance within the inheritance that we're reading. We just went through these big, big block of cities. Simeon in 19 is going to get an inheritance inside of that. And so ahead in Joshua 19, we finally see a mention of Bethlehem, but that's because we're right now we're getting a, a or, or in 19, it's a more magnified, tighter view of Simeon's inheritance. But here in Joshua 15, we're getting a much more wide view, a bigger, wider view than the tight view we're going to see in 19. And so with this vast view that we're getting right now, the view is so wide here in Joshua 15 that Bethlehem is not even recorded. It's so wide of you that Bethlehem doesn't even make the list. So Micah's prophecy refers to Bethlehem as being little, yet the Messiah is going to come from it. Now, I got to thinking about this. Why are we not seeing Bethlehem? I'm still wondering, why are we not seeing Bethlehem? Well, when I consider the fact that Micah said that Bethlehem is so small, so small among all the other cities to where it's not even listed in Joshua 15. I think what we can see here is that God loves to use little things to demonstrate his power. That's what I get from this. 
little things to demonstrate the greatness of his power. I want to take you through some thoughts real quick through stories you may know. Smallness is the way that God brought forth a great nation and blessed all the earth through a barren woman named Sarah. Smallness. Smallness is the way that God used a lowly shepherd to kill a heavenly, a heavily armed giant with a slingshot. Smallness. <laughs> Smallness is the way that God made a young shepherd boy king of all Israel when he wasn't even invited to stand among his brothers for consideration. Smallness is the way that God enabled Samson to, set, uh, to kill a thousand men using the jawbone of a donkey. Smallness. Smallness is the way God used an old man's walking stick to swallow the serpents of magicians, turn rivers into blood, and part the sea to wipe out entire armies through smallness. Smallness is the way that God used just a handful of flour and a little bit of oil to feed a poor widow, Elijah, and her entire household for many days. Smallness is how Jesus had only five loaves of bread and two fish, but he fed over 5,000 people. <laughs> Smallness is how God is glorifying himself to the world through tiny Israel with all the nations against it. And smallness is how salvation was brought to all of us through Jesus Christ while suffering nailed to a cross through smallness. And so as we see here in Joshua 15, little fruitful Bethlehem is just exactly the town God intended for the Messiah of our salvation to make his entrance into human history. Do y'all see this? Isn't this good? And so what can we learn from this smallness of Bethlehem, not even being mentioned here in Joshua 15? We learned that it is in your own smallness that God can also work through you to go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the glory of the Father. Because I know you feel small at times. God can use you. God works through smallness. Isn't that great? Many people, they, and, and I struggled with this and still do, uh, people consider themselves too small, too weak, too inefficient. I'm not articulate enough. I don't sound like all those other great pastors that have been doing it for 20, 30 plus years on the radio and what all. I don't sound like them. I don't look like them. <laughs> people look at me. I say, I'm a pastor. They look at me funny like, you? I, I feel small. I feel like I, I shouldn't be doing this. I feel inefficient, like I really can't do it. Not good enough to be used by God. And when people think like this, they incorrectly assume that God can't work through them. Smallness is exactly what God works through. You feel small? Ah, oh, you're in a good place. God can use you greatly. That's exactly what God works through, so don't count yourself out. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. One thing I always try to tell people from this verse, I use this verse, when somebody, something bad happens, someone dies, they get this disease, or they fall into bad financial situations, and, th and there's just no answer that seems to work. And everybody's trying to comfort them, and it's just so sharp. It, it, just, it just doesn't, it's just not enough. I have one thing I can pull out from my sleeve that I can tell them. God does his best work in our weakness. When people are really hurting and really down, this is what I tell them. This is the best I got. I tell them, hey, I show them that verse. I said, hey, this is where God's going to do his best stuff. So take comfort in that. I don't know what to tell them about how it's going to be better. I don't know where their money is going to come from. I don't know how their health is going to get better. If they just lost a loved one, I can't bring them back. But I can tell them, this is where God does his best work. You remember that when you are hurting or if somebody you know is hurting, tell them that. That's where God does his best stuff. 1 Corinthians 1.27 God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the what? The weak things 
of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. (laughs) You feel weak? Good. Let God work through you. If you're walking around saying, I'm awesome, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I got it all down, uh uh-uh, you're done. Take a seat. Hit the pause button. You feel weak? You feel inefficient like Moses? I can't talk. I'm not a good speaker. Let somebody else do it. Oh, God's like, no, I'm going to use you. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. I try to find... um, Try to find this godly comfort because we all go through this. We all have inefficiencies and we feel a lack of confidence at times. If you've been distressed in your weakness, if you've been pressured in your weakness, if you stop walking with God in your weakness, you start getting foul about it, start hating people, getting grudges and all that kind of stuff going on, then I want to suggest maybe you've got this formula backwards. Maybe you've been trying to use your own strength for your own glory instead of using your weakness for God's glory. Maybe spin this formula backwards. You've been going at it wrong. This is what repentance is. This is what repentance is like this. I've turned around. That's repentance. That's all repentance is. It's turning around. I'm all proud and I'm mighty and I'm I'm just doing it. Y'all watch me. I'm I'm the prime example of what it looks like. Oh, you're done. You need to turn around and go back the other way. You need to get small need to get low. That's why the Bible says every knee will bow, because when you bow, you get low. It's a good place to be. God does His best stuff through weakness. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So bow the knee to Jesus and get small. Bow the knee to get small. God works through small things. God brought the Messiah through from Bethlehem, not even mentioned. You think God could work through you? Well, I'm too small. Exactly. That's what I mean. God can work through you. He works through small things, even like you and me. So now let's look again here at Joshua 15, verse 63, because I know y'all saw this. Joshua 15, verse 63. says, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. So what happened here? Why couldn't they get the Jebusites out? What's going on? Weren't they supposed to have success in driving them out? Let's go back and recall this promise real quick in Joshua 3.10. It says, and Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail Drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites without fail. God will without fail. So wait a minute. If it was promised that God would drive out the Jebusites, why can't they get them out of Jerusalem? Here's my next problem I got to deal with. What is going on? Why can't they get them out? What's going on? I just want to say real quick before we go any further, this is an opportunity This is what I call opportunity, okay? Let me explain. Most people, being unbelieving skeptics, I would put it, they look at a biblical moment like this and they go, oh, look, there's an error. Oh, look, there's something wrong. Huh, so much for your God. Okay, if you want to be a lightweight theologian, go ahead and call it that. It's not an error. It's not. They say, well, if God said he would get them out, apparently he didn't deliver on this promise. So if God can't deliver on this promise, how can I trust anything God says? And they'll try to trip you up. And if you're not ready for them, they'll get you and you'll be ashamed of yourself for not being ready. But we who believe, we know that the Bible is inerrant. Means there's no errors in it at all. And we also know that when God makes a promise, he always delivers on it. Always. So why now? Here's the question again. Why are they unable to drive the Jebusites out? What are we supposed to do with this? This is an opportunity. Today I'm going to try to build you up. Okay? So let's all, let's all go build up together. Here's what you do. Here's how you get ready for things like this. All right? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Do not let the skeptics make you ashamed. Oh, you're, look, an error. Your God can't deliver it. Don't let them have that. How do you counter it? You be studied. Do you read the Word? Man, not much. 
well, I hear what you preach, Ray. If all you're hearing is what I preach, you're messing up. <laughs> you need to go home and study. You need to read. You need to come in here armed and ready to go. Sharpen your sword, man. Come in here and join us on Sunday, and you'll get a little more out of it through the assembly. But you've got to be studied. You've got you to get in there. So let's try to take this story as an opportunity, not just to find out why the Jebusites are still in Jerusalem, but also to learn how to get where stories like this won't get us caught ashamed in front of God mockers. Okay? Do you want to be a diligent worker approved before God? I do. So if you agree to that, then we're going to study. It's easy to just read. Study is different than just reading. We're going to study the word of the truth to find the answer. And to do this, we have to keep this story in its context. What I was talking about context earlier, you get some little, few little words off, and it throws everything out. We're going to bring it back into context. We're not going to, oh, look, God can't deliver. Oh, oh, God can't keep a promise. Error. No. Context. We're going to bring it into the context. What I mean by this is we have to consider that in the previous chapters of Joshua, there were times that there was sin among the Israelites and it messed everything up. We remember that. Do you remember the sin of Achan from Joshua 7? Achan did what God said not to do. He collected spoils of war from a city that they destroyed and he kept it and he hid it in the camp because God said, don't do that. And they paid for it. It caused the next conquest of the Israelites to be defeated at the city of Ai. And 36 Israelite men died because of it. Because the sin of Achan. They had to find him out. They had to find out where's the sin in the camp. Where's the sin in the camp? And it fell on, on Achan. And they went after him. And he would not repent. He would not repent. They had to get him out. This is biblical. Oh, the house of God is open to everybody. No, it's not. I will argue that point. It's not. The unrepentant. Achan would not repent, and it caused people to die. It caused damage. So what we have here, sin is not permitted in the assembly because it does damage, and Israel's own sin kept them from walking forward in God's promises. It was not that God could not deliver on the promise. It was not that God refused to deliver on the promise. It was because Israel had sin that prolonged the timeline on which God could fulfill that promise. Israel's sin did this. Everybody wants to blame God. Oh God, you couldn't do that. Context Who's messing up here? God or Israel? we got to remember, we're the sinner, not him. That's the context here in the book of Joshua. Israel's sin prolonged the timeline for which God could fulfill the promise. And several times we have where God promised Israel sinned, and so God delayed the promise. God promised somebody sinned, so he delayed the promise. It's not that he broke the promise. It's just you're messed up. I can't give you the promise if you're acting like this. Sin will keep you held back from God's blessings. Sin will keep you in damage mode. And it's not God's fault for delaying the promises. It's our fault, the sinner. God will deliver the promise, but sin can ruin your shot at being part of it like you should be. We should keep in mind that God kept renewing on His promise to drive the people out of the land. He kept saying He was going to do it, even though Israel continued to mess up. He still renewed that promise. Now, after Achan's sin and after Israel's defeat at the city of Ai, God still reassured Joshua back in Joshua 13.6. He said, them I will drive out from before the children of Israel. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so God gave us assurance that he would drive everybody out. Eventually, it'll get there. How are you walking in obedience, though, is the question. So here we are in chapter 15. And the Jebusites are still not yet conquered and driven out of Jerusalem because God is not going to deliver while man's being sinful. There's sin in the camp somewhere. And so apparently there's some sin in Israel. It keeps the Israelites from driving the Jebusites, the Jebusites out. Now, I do want to tell you where, so that you can see the fulfillment of the promise, so that the skeptics can be blown out of the water. <laughs> this is not a, a mistake. 
God does deliver on his promise to drive the Jebusites out, but that does not happen until much later in King David's time in 2 Samuel 5 and 6. It says, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. There it is. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Friend, are you waiting on a promise? And it ain't come? Hmm. Is there sin in your camp? Uh Uh-oh. You realize sometimes we can be our own worst enemy? God did drive out the Jebusites as He promised, but it was fulfilled on God's timeline, not man's. On God's timeline. We're the sinner, not God. When God makes a promise, He'll do it. But it's not our place to demand that God act on our timetable. God acts on His timetable. And a lot of times it depends on how we're being towards Him, obedient or patient. God works on His timetable. We should be obedient and patient to that. And so I wanted to use this passage today as an opportunity to show you how to not let unbelievers put you to shame, but rather for us to be diligent to study Scripture. You don't get to this by just reading every now and then. You can't get to this just by hearing me. You've got to be reading that sucker, man. You've got to be reading the Word of God. Read the Bible once a year and start over again. Keep going. Fill that reservoir up. Get some information in there. And you'll start connecting this to that and that to this, and it'll start working to where these skeptics come and they want to go boink and pluck a little scripture out of nowhere. Hey, look, error. You go, no, no, no. David took care of it later, man. Oh, okay. Shut them up, right? We've got to look ahead through the word, diligent to study scripture, back through the book of Joshua to gain the context and then also look ahead through more study of the Word to find out how this is not an error in the Bible, that the Jebusites couldn't be pushed out, even though God promised they would be. So how did I know about 2 Samuel? Talking about God pushing out the Jebusites through King David. Because I studied. Because I read. I put in the time. I was diligent about it. Well, Ray, you're a pastor. That's what you have to do. We're all supposed to do it. Be diligent to study God's Word. Push hard to find the answer. God mockers and lazy people will always resort to Scripture plucking. But those who want to present themselves approved to God will do more than lazy plucking. They will diligently work, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And you cannot get this through t-shirt and bumper sticker theology. doesn't happen. That's what a lot of people do. Oh, good bumper sticker. I like that. Oh, I want that shirt. That's awesome. Great shirt. Great bumper sticker. But don't let that be the basis on what you believe. You need to read the Word of God. Go home. Open your Bible. Turn off that TV a little bit more often. And pursue to understand more and more of God's Word. Pursue to understand your Messiah. Pursue to understand your king who gave his whole life to die on the cross to save you. Isn't that not worth your time? You know, my grandmother was 93 years old one, and uh, she used to like playing that game. Guess how old I am? <laughs> and we would always pretend not to know, right? She was proud of her age. Oh, I don't know. And you undercut it like, I don't know, 80? <laughs> She was 93. She she loved telling you that she was 93. I'm 93. And then she grabbed her Bible next to her chair. And she goes, you know, I've been reading this Bible every day as much as I can for most of my life. And every time I read it, I get something totally new like I'd never seen it before. At 93. (laughs) 93. You know, you'll never discover any dinosaur bones with a garden trowel and a couple scoops. It takes digging It takes digging and research and deep holes. So dig deep. Get way down in God's Word. Study to show thyself approved. And He'll show you the answer. The Jebusites, they did get run out eventually. God did deliver on His promise, but He did it through King David on His own timeline. Let us learn to be obedient and patient. The God of Israel is good. He's good. And He does deliver on His promises. That's why when it says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, I'm not in heaven yet, Ray. 
I'm not in heaven yet, Ray. Well, God's going to deliver. <laughs> okay, he'll do it. Aren't you glad salvation's a promise? Ooh, man, if it wasn't, we'd be in trouble. It's not a sin license. It's something to take comfort in. So today we saw how God establishes small things so that he can work great promises through them, just like little Jerusalem would bring forth the Messiah. We also saw how a little sin can be a great hindrance on God working great things because he won't work through that sin. Just like how Judah could not drive out the Jebusites, even though God promised that it would come to pass. What we can get out of this is today, if you will dedicate yourself to be diligently working to rightly divide the word of truth, not pluck, 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 pluck. You want to pluck? Go work at a chicken factory. But if you really want to get deep in the word of God and be diligent to show yourself approved, it takes time, it takes study. God loves that. But also, when you rightly divide the word of truth, not only will you come to know the promises that God gives you, but you'll also come to know how to live obediently and patient so that God can work his promises through your little life. And he'll do it. Remember, smallness is not what keeps God from working mightily in your life. Smallness does not stop God from working in your life. Smallness is what God works through. It's the sin that stops that. Good point of decision for all of us, isn't it? Um, you know, I haven't been doing this, and one of the reasons why I opened this up is because, like what Dove did, I want to give you a chance to respond today. What I want to do is I want to ask you, if you want to call to repentance Maybe you haven't been obedient. Maybe there's some sin in your camp. Maybe there's something hindering your walk. This is open up front. If one comes, more will come. And it's not, I'm not going to make you cough it up and admit it to anybody up here. Maybe you've had a lack of patience. Maybe you have mistaken God's timing as an unanswered prayer. Maybe you're waiting on something to happen that's still yet to happen. It's going to happen. We just need to trust in God, okay? If you want to pray, come up here right now and we're going to pray. Father God, draw your people. Lord God, draw your people, whoever wants to come forward. Lord, we ask forgiveness. Lord, we repent. Lord, we have been impatient. Lord, we have been too quick. We have been trying to work things out on our own glory, on our own steam, our own strength, and we're out and we're tired. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord God, for jumping the gun. Forgive us, God, that we forgot to stop and wait on you. Lord, this is on you. We, we ask you to help us, Lord God, and we, we turn around. We give it back to you. Never was ours in the first place. Our way was never going to fix it. We ask you, Lord God, to take over. It's yours. That's what calling you Lord means, is that it is all yours. Father, I've been looking for promise in my life. I've been looking for blessing, and I just can't seem to get a hold of it. I'm distressed. I'm ashamed when mockers come and put me against the wall, and I'm tired of it, and I want it to change. Lord God, I turn, and I hand it to you. I want to dil diligently give myself to the study of your word, and I want you to take over, Lord God. Today, now, Lord God, right now, Lord this big problem, this big hindrance, I let it go. It's yours. It's gone. Take it, Lord God, and do your work with it. Lord, I feel small. I feel so small. I feel insignificant. I feel like I have nothing. But Lord, I learned today, that's what you work through. Work through me, God. All those who have come for prayer and all those praying in their seat right now, Lord, take their in inefficiencies, take their lack of confidence, take their lack of strength, their smallness, Lord, and do great and mighty things through them as they give it up to you. O little town of Bethlehem, which was declared Bethlehem Ephrathah, fruitful through which the Messiah would come and bring salvation to all men. Lord, work through small me to carry the gospel to all these people that I know. And where I feel weak, that's where you're strong. Do your work, Lord God. I thank you for it. Thank you for those who have prayed. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As I say, you are not worthless, you are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. You have great opportunity in the power of God through your smallness. Okay? Amen. Thank you all for coming. And the next time I come up here with my sunglasses on my pocket, somebody tell me. That just kind of looks weird up here, doesn't it? Thank you all.